Good morning. So uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, special event. And uh, first I introduce myself. My name is Murray Gibson. I'm the Dean of the College of Science here at Northeastern University. And um, about as long as we are aware of, people have always been awed by the vastness of the ocean, the sea. In fact, I got a quote here from a romantic poet, Lord Byron, who said, roll on deep and dark blue ocean, roll. 10,000 fleets sweep over thee in vain. Man marks the earth with ruin, but his control stops with the shore. Romantic, but wrong. Some of you last night had the pleasure of hearing Sylvia Earle give a really outstanding talk. She's an amazing, uh, a national treasure, I think she's been called, among other things. And she gave a passionate, uh, compelling, and sobering talk about, the, uh, about these challenges facing the ocean. It, it was optimistic, too. I mean, she points out, of course, that the ocean isn't endless and that we've taken for so long for granted things which won't be necessarily there, the resources in the sea, uh, its beauty and its massive but mostly hidden role in climate, for example. <clears throat> These are all in jeopardy, as you all know very well. And she pointed out in order for us to in order for us to protect these resources, we need to understand them better. And that's the role, of course, that science plays. She also pointed out how many, most humans live at the coast. And uh, most humans live in cities on the coast. And as a result, the unique challenges facing coastal ecosystems in urban, near urban environments are really important and in particular need of study. And that's a segue to the subject of this conference and the subject of our initiative here at Northeastern University, where, where the conference is focusing on a couple of the big challenges that are facing coastal ecosystems. Um, and um, I'm delighted that we have some outstanding speakers from around the world who are experts in this area. And we have uh, Richard Harris, uh, award-winning NPR journalist, who will help moderate the discussion to talk about these really important issues. Uh, as I said, this is a kickoff for us to kind of get you to be involved in our efforts here to build up in the area of sustaining coastal cities. When I joined Northeastern two and a half years ago, we had this, I had this unique opportunity to hire a lot of faculty. That's partly what attracted me to come here. And uh, knowing that you can't squander such an opportunity by hiring all over the place, but instead need to be strategic in order that you can develop some expertise and partner with other institutions for things that you don't have, we spent some time talking about areas, initiatives in which we would really invest. Investing being primarily faculty, but also money, because we certainly have spent a lot of money to recruit faculty and to build infrastructure and so forth. And one of the things that emerged was this urban coastal sustainability initiative. The idea of looking at cities by the sea and the challenges facing them, with a focus initially on the coastal ecosystems, but trying to integrate that with the land and ultimately with the built environment. So this has become a major university initiative in sustainability. And uh, it's, it's pretty obvious to people why this matters. But you may ask, why Northeastern? Why are we in a position to do this? And the answer to that, I think, is the Marine Science Center, which I'll show you a movie of in a second. We, would, we could have held the, uh, the event out there, but we don't really have the space for such a large number of people. So instead, we have a movie that will show you. The Marine Science Center is less than two dozen miles away. And uh, it's um, a unique asset in which it's one of the very few marine stations that's located in an urban coastal environment, a very heavily urban coastal environment. So if, if we could key up the movie, which I guess I can do here, give you a few minutes of overview. <laughs> very few marine labs, places like it anywhere in the country or in the world, where you can walk right across the lawn and be in the field working on a rocky shoreline, an exposed rocky shoreline like this one. So that's what really drew me to this place and is one of the things that I absolutely love about it. The Urban Coastal Sustainability Initiative emerged from our strategic planning when I first came as the Dean of the College of Science. We were seeking some really no-brainer ideas for areas where we could, we could sort of take leadership, world leadership, 
uh, in our hiring, we have the ability to hire a lot of faculty and we wanted to be strategic about hiring in areas that could really make a difference. So one of the very obvious ones was to build on the existing Marine Science Center. The main reason we should focus on uh, urban coastal sustainability issues is because the vast majority of the world's population lives along coastal ecosystems. Uh, over half of the world's gross domestic e uh, product is produced in coastal environments or adjacent to them. So there's clear economic value to understanding uh, how sustainability is going to be important moving forward. I see the you know the urban coastal sustainability initiative, you know, being a very broad initiative uh, where Northeastern is taking a leadership role and really pushing the envelope on what we can contribute um, as a as a you know leaders in the area of sustainability research. And I see my um, role in that is connecting with the range of scientists we've brought in here to push us to be leaders in the in the realm of fisheries uh, sustainability. huge portion of the world's population, especially in the U.S., lives in coastal areas and, and more and more people are moving towards coastal zones. It, it puts stress on the ecosystems, but it also points to the importance of how the ecosystems in the coastal environment um, benefit society. And so in, in the Boston area, we have this, this really unique opportunity to look at how this, this coupled human natural system works, um, how we can move forward uh, in a way that works both for the natural environment and for the built environment um, in ways that are both ecologically and economically sound. I think the Urban and Coastal Sustainability Initiative is um, ideally suited for, for Northeastern in this area because, um, you know, obviously this is an urban area, but you come out to the MSC and um, there are these amazing coastal habitats that we can do research on. Um, and then there are also so many uh, additional um, research institutions in the area to collaborate with. It just provides a great um, nexus for collaboration. One of the main reasons that I came to Northeastern University is the ability to do work here. You know, most of my work is focused at understanding processes and dynamics on the shoreline and the ability to merge the work I do here in the lab at the Marine Science Center with being able to go right out here on the shore and conduct experiments is an incredibly powerful tool. Students and their involvement is critical. In this case, we have a new marine biology major that we introduced just a couple of years ago, which clearly strongly connects with the MSC and the Urban Coastal Sustainability Initiative. But we're also um, looking at opportunities for the students to do co-op, both in research labs. So we've hired more faculty, and therefore there's more research activity going on in this area, more opportunities for students to do research experience, both as internships and co-ops. We've uh, just uh, formed this new graduate program in ecology, evolution, and marine biology. This is the first of what we hope are multiple graduate programs that are going to focus on our goals of becoming an academic and research leader in environmental studies and in environmental science and marine science uh, more broadly. So one of the, th the things scientists have tried to do in recent years are restore the habitats that were naturally along the coastlines and oyster reefs were one of the great examples of these. They provide lots of benefits for societies like fish and a harvestable oyster itself but they also protect the shoreline. Non-researchers can always, um, you know, come out and learn more about what we're doing. Some people find it's interesting to, um, you know, volunteer, come in the field, just check things out and learn more about it. The worst thing would be if we, we kept this within the academic community. We, we have to reach out um, to everyone else as well. We really need people that are passionate about environmental issues uh, to really join with us and help us uh, move this forward because I can promise you um, that we'll make them proud of their investment in us. In that film you can see some of the half dozen new faculty that we hired in the last year in this area to build on the existing dozen faculty that we have uh, in marine environmental science and uh, we intend to hire more people. Some of those are jointly appointed and as you can see from this slide we view the Marine Science Center as the focal point, you might say the center of this, but really we want to bring the entire university to bear policy, law, business, economics, engineering, 
uh, and architecture to create a sort of uh, interdisciplinary connected initiative that really, as we all know, science in, in the abstract is, is not very useful in influencing what humans do. Policy is equally important and so forth. So we need to integrate these things and that's, I think, one of the very exciting uh, directions in which we're going. Um, I'd like to thank a few people before I conclude here. Uh, many of people who supported this conference, uh, both financially and other ways, but I'd also particularly like to thank my staff, and in particular Megan Eckner over here, who, who has really uh, organized this entire event uh, very efficiently and effectively, so I appreciate all the hard work that was done. And I want to thank all of you for participating. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Jeff Trussell now, who's the chair of our Marine Environmental Science Department, who'll say a few words. Jeff is a renowned uh, intertidal ecologist in his own right. Uh, but in addition, he has a unique uh, combination of vision, drive, and empathy that makes for a great leader. And uh, truthfully, what you're seeing here is Jeff's vision, and my job has simply been to sort of enable that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jeff Trussell. Thanks, Murray. I appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a great day, it's a great event. We're very fortunate to have uh, this impressive group of speakers uh, be with us. In fact, we're all quite spoiled. Um, I just wanna give you a quick overview before I introduce, introduce our first speaker. Uh, the way we're gonna set things up is we're gonna have uh, two different speakers, um, each speaking on two different topics. So first, we'll have uh, Ove Herr uh, Her Goldberg, we went through that, <laughs> my apologies, Ove, and Steve Hawkins talking in a general sense about the plight of marine ecosystems. And then after that, in the afternoon, we'll have um, Larry Crowder and Steve Gaines speaking about fisheries more specifically, given that that's one of the major issues that's confronting, or the challenges that those fisheries are experiencing represents one of the major issues uh, that the oceans are facing. Um, after each pair of discussions, we'll have a little bit of a break, and then we'll have a moderated discussion. We're very fortunate to have Richard Harris here. Richard will moderate the discussion among the panelists, and then hopefully uh, he'll dynamically uh, get the uh, audience involved. So it, it, it looks to be a very exciting and informative day and again I can't stress enough how fortunate we are to have uh, these speakers here. The first person I'd like to introduce is uh, Ove Herr Goldberg. Ove is the inaugural director of the Global Change Institute and professor of marine science at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, in 1999 Ove was awarded the Eureka Prize for his research and in 2012 he was awarded a Thompson Reuters Citation Award in recognition of his research, particularly on climate change. One of the main reasons that we asked Ove to join us is that he has really championed the critical importance of communicating the discovery of science, the discoveries of science to the broadest audience as possible. So he's one of these uh, scientists that's not doing science in the abstract. He's engaging humanity and society and helping inform and guide uh, how we're gonna be behaving in the future so that we can hopefully achieve greater sustainability with our natural environments. So, Ove, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Please welcome Ove. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for that generous uh, introduction. I was going to do two things. Um, the first thing I was going to do was to answer a question, which I think is, um, there it is, um, which I think sets the scene. Uh, and then the second thing I'll do is to talk more specifically about one particular ecosystem, coral reefs and the challenges that the, that ecosystem is facing with respect to a, a changing climate. Now, um, when you pose this question, it's quite interesting because uh, there are a number of, of, of possible an answers. And so I was gonna go through a couple of these, these sort of uh, ways you could answer this question. And of course, the first reason that we might worry about the ocean is that it's unique. Now, how unique? Well, in fact, there is an answer to this if you go and talk to exobiologists and you ask the question, uh, you know, how rare is planet Earth, uh, uh, a planet that is covered 71% of its surface with a salty ocean, 
And they'll say, well, to get something like Earth, you've got to be in the so-called habitable zone, which means you can't be too close to a sun, otherwise water evaporates and disappears. But you can't be too far away because then uh, water is no longer liquid anymore. And of course, uh, this key feature uh, of our planet um, determines life. And of course, there are other things like, uh, well, if you've got a big star, you've got to be a bit further away and so on and so forth. Well, when you look at that and you look at the consequences of being outside the habitable zone, and on the right-hand side, you've got the surface of Mars, just misses out. Probably had water at some point, but it's, it's uh, either locked deep in the soil as a frozen uh, substance uh, or it's just gone. And of course, on the left-hand side, you've just got a picture from just outside my lab in Australia on Heron Island. Uh, and you can see, obviously, a very wet, lively scene there. And of course, um, the chances of a planet being in the habitable zone at the right stage of its evolution, such that you have water, is apparently a one in 100,000 planets. Two consequences, we're unlikely to ever go to another planet like Earth, because it just simply won't be close unless you have some sort of uh, freak of probability. And of course, we are very unique. All right, well, you know, another reason to worry about the ocean is that, um, well, it's just very beautiful. Um, we're so often now nickeling and diming everything, uh, where everything has to have an economic value, that we sort of forget that when we see scenes like this. Now, this is um, one of 200,000 images we collected last year from the Great Barrier Reef. And it's part of this Catlin Seaview survey where we're going around and literally trying to reveal the oceans to people. And I'll come back to this concept at the end. But, you know, here's a picture that I took last year um, during that survey. And what you see there are these beautiful little fish called uh, Oxymonocanthus longirostris, the orange spotted file fish, right? Now, they're as beautiful and unique as a Monet painting, right? And we refer to Monet paintings as being sort of priceless, right? You, you don't go and nickel and dime then and say, well, you know, there's a, the value of a Monet painting is the canvas and the wood and a bit of paint, you know, $5.99 at your local bargain store. We talk about these things as being priceless. And I think we also, when we think of the sea and worry about it, it's got a value like that, that once these things are gone, you've lost a billion years of evolution. And of course, similar with those million species that live in and around coral reefs and the probably 10 million that live throughout the, throughout the ocean. Well, this is, uh, these are my kids, Fiona and Chris. And this is in Indonesia. And they're one of the 0.1% of humanity that's actually gone diving. Now, again, I'll come back to this. This is at the heart of one of the solutions we need to uh, put in place if we're going to uh, deal with uh, some of the big issues that, that oceans are facing. Another reason for worrying about oceans is that they are critically important. And Sylvia last night gave a very eloquent and poetic account of our connectivity to, to oceans. But I thought I'd just remind us of a couple of things. Oceans provide protein for a billion people. That's an enormous source of, of food. And they're also seen as an area which, if we get to sustainable aquaculture, could provide a lot more protein in a world that is going to be increasingly hungry. Now, um, Ocean systems, of course, have goods and services which support uh, industries like tourism. So they're important to our economies. This is a platform on the Great Barrier Reef run by the tour operator Quicksilver, a really large operation. And uh, it's part of a, an economic value to the state of Queensland, where I come from, of $6 billion each year in terms of tourist values that come in. Uh, from people being employed in and around the Great Barrier Reef. And that's 63,000 people that uh, enjoy those benefits. So, so we've got food and we've got income, and of course we've got planetary services. And these are critical to our survival. 
And in fact, when we talk about sustaining coastal cities, there is no city on our planet that's not coastal or not influenced by, uh, by the ocean. And I think that's a really important concept, is that there's such connectivity now between cities and the ocean, whether it's where our weather systems come from, that we, we really have to start to rethink things. Now, just in terms of planetary um, um, uh, services, you know, 50% of the oxygen we breathe comes from uh, phytoplankton uh, in the upper layers of, of the ocean. Uh, if we take a look at the extra CO2 being added by the burning of fossil fuels, 30% of that goes into the ocean. And at the same time, over 95% of the extra heat trapped by the greenhouse effect is disappearing into the ocean. So this is a, an enormous service, if you like. And of course, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Oceans are incredibly important to our existence. Well, there are other reasons why we should worry about the ocean. Uh, one is that we are inextricably connected with it. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the water cycle, the hydrological cycle, which is this flow of water where oceans are evaporating moisture, it's joining the atmosphere, it's falling down along landscapes, flowing through streams. That, that connectivity between land and ocean is incredibly important. And if you take just the case of Western Australian farmers, this is a wheat field, it's our wheat belt if you like, and it depends on moisture coming from the ocean. In fact, farmers now use the temperature differential between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean to predict whether or not, with quite a degree of accuracy, uh, whether they should be planting or not or preparing for a drought or, 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 uh, or whether the season is going to be a good one, 12 months out. So this is another example where you can't run from the ocean. It's, it's hugely important. And of course, uh, in this part of the world, uh, in Europe and so on, benefiting from the flow of ocean uh, currents, the warmth and water that goes to higher latitudes, is sort of heating these places up by five degrees on average. And so places like um, Britain, if you didn't have the Gulf Stream uh, shown on the right-hand side there, you would have conditions that would be like, I think it's Leningrad or one of those uh, Siberian cities. Um, bit of a showstopper, but instead you've had the ocean influence through its connectivity between connecting the warm tropical Caribbean uh, environments with Europe, uh, it's changed history and it's determined uh, how profitable we've been. And of course, in today's day and age, there are other types of connectivity that are going on. And one of those is the consumption of seafood. We'll hear a little bit more about that today in discussions and lectures. But this is a really important issue at the moment because we've globalised the consumption of seafood. So the top graphic there is uh, the origin of fish eaten by Europeans. And you can see that almost every part of the world is being drawn on for food. And the same with the US that you're certainly fishing your own waters, but large parts of Southeast Asia are a draw for the food that you find in your supermarkets. And of course, this connectivity um, uh, highlights the importance of oceans, but it also highlights the fact that we've now got a situation where countries are drawing down fisheries that are in other countries' waters, and it's a really complex issue. And so if we're going to solve these things, it's got to be taken into, a, into account. Of course, there are other types of connectivity. One of the ones which is sort of fascinating and horrifying is the fact that that 30% of CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels that's gone into the ocean has also changed the chemistry of the ocean in a rather fundamental way. Now I'm going to try and... Yes. CO2 that's pushed into the air has been fluxing into the ocean at uh, increasing rates since the Industrial Revolution. CO2 loves to uh, party with water and reacts with water to create bicarbonate, which dissociates and you get the carbonate ion, a certain amount depending on, on uh, temperature and so on. That carbonate ion is really important to the production of calcium carbonate, so skeletons of, of many marine creatures that are calcifying depend on this. And of course, once you add CO2, what essentially happens here is that the proton 
that comes from the dissociation event of bicarb likes to go and find carbonate ions and turn them into bicarbonate. And that's at the basis for uh, one of the big influences that ocean acidification is having on marine ecosystems. And I'll show you some experiments we've been doing in Australia that show that it's a really potent change here. The other thing that's going on is that uh, this change in pH is also having uh, a major effect on marine organisms. Uh, things like uh, the exchange of gases by, uh, across the gills of fish is very pH dependent. So there's a whole series of things there. Well, I want to now move into the rather gloomy subject is that even though we rate the ocean as being very important, it's unique, it's beautiful, we are doing it in at a very high rate. Now I'll say up front, I don't have time to talk about solutions and in fact the speakers that follow me are world experts in those solutions. So what I'm going to do is just simply outline some of those, those big problems. The first problem is simply our drawer on seafood. And this is a graphic from a paper by Myers and Worm, quite a famous one that appeared in Nature. There's a lot of discussion around this. Not everyone is, is completely behind their conclusions. But the data are pretty compelling. And what it shows here is that you've got all of these uh, uh, fisheries, if you like, and the amount of biomass of those fisheries as you begin to fish them from an industrial point of view. And you can see that the average life of those fisheries before they drop to about 10% of their original biomass is around 15 years. So this, of course, uh, is uh, reasons for great concern. We'll hear, as I said, some, a couple of uh, speakers later on who talk about the issue of fisheries and what we can do about that. But of course, we do have some very perverse things going on. Even though the data say that, um, in Australia, we've just had a company um, put in place uh, a so-called super trawler. Now, the very perverse argument about this trawler is that it's uh, apparently fishing sustainably and efficiently. What I see there is at the heart of the problem with fishing, and that is that you've had a company invest in a lot of very expensive hardware that they now need to pay off. And usually the only way to do that with, in a fishery sense is to fish like mad. So this type of uh, change going on is, is still really not being understood uh, by governments and so on. Now, I want to introduce this uh, individual. This is a parrotfish. Just to make the point that it's not just fisheries that we need to worry about in terms of, of fish being caught. Now, parrotfish are the gardeners of coral reefs. And what they do is they've got a beak like a parrot, and they're often coloured like a parrot. This is a male. Um, they will go along grazing the algae. And by doing that, they're keeping the weeds down, essentially. Now, if you catch these fish and eat them, you can get to a situation where an entire ecosystem will shift and change. And this is an ex experiment uh, which was uh, done by uh, Terry Hughes. I was part of the team uh, where what we did was to go out onto a reef crest and build these big cages. And some of the cages we left open to grazing fishes, and other ones we, they were cages, there was no way in. And so essentially you had a situation where fish were prevented from entering the enclosures so they couldn't graze, and in others, you could allow the fish to come in and graze. After nine months, this top uh, picture here, the reef, the coral reef, had turned into an algal forest. Now, that's great if you like algal forests, but it's not a great place to do tourism. I, I'm, I remain to be convinced if that's not right. But where you allowed fish to come and graze, the corals were able to uh, thrive. And so they, they, they were sort of growing and recruiting and so on. And it came down to a very simple effect, and that is that um, if you don't have grazers to keep the algae down, then corals can't recruit in and they can't get sunlight and they can't grow. So fish are important way beyond the protein that they have in their bodies. 
There are other sorts of connectivity that we have and problems. One of the big problems is plastic. And uh, this uh, scientist here is Kathy Townsend, who works out of Moreton Bay in Brisbane. And she's been studying plastic. And of course, it's the toys, the shoes, the plastic bags that come from cities that end up in the ocean and they've got uh, incredibly long lives. And in some cases, they look like jellyfish and of course, turtles eat them and choke. In other cases, they look like nice little yummy bits. And this is a seabird that's died with 20 or so pieces of plastic in the belly. And this is a, a young uh, flatback turtle uh, where Kath uh, took all of this out of the crop of these organisms. Because often these organisms have spaces in their digestive tract where these things just get lodged. There are other problems with plastics, and one of the other problems, of course, is that they have chemicals in their manufacture that still leak out of the plastic, which are often potent um, um, mimics of hormones and so on. So you get the sex changing, you get uh, carcinomas and so on. So there's a really big problem there. One of the most fascinating parts of this is that there is now a plastic whirlpool in the Pacific. I don't know whether you, you knew that, but um, just through the perversity of currents spinning, just like you stir, you can actually concentrate things. There's now this really large patch of plastic um, that's sort of accumulating. And of course, this is rather depressing because uh, no matter where you go in the ocean now, and you can be out in the most remote parts, and you go ashore or you look in the water and a Coke bottle goes by, or the high tide mark is just a sort of a, a litany, a, a rubbish dump of, of humanity's plastic. And of course, this is a major issue that has to, be, um, has to be solved. Well, of course, if you thought all that was bad, and I am Dr. Doom, un unashamedly, <laughs> Um, of course, the rise of, of hu the human population and its demand for uh, energy is probably the most uh, frightening. And what you're seeing in the background there is uh, images at night time from uh, the International Space Station. And the graphic is uh, human population, the blue line, and then the uh, use of fuel in exajoules, uh, which is the red line. And you can see that they are completely correlated. And of course, with that comes uh, huge amounts of CO2 being pumped into the atmosphere. And as you know, we are experiencing a situation where more heat is being trapped than is being re-radiated into space. So we have an imbalance in the energy budget of the Earth, and that's then driving up temperatures. And so we are about 0.9 of a degree Celsius above the average global temperature prior to the takeoff of human populations and their fuel, fuel use. Well, as I said before, most of that energy has gone into the oceans. And this graphic here shows what has gone into land and atmosphere. And this is the content that's gone into uh, the ocean. Now, uh, at the moment, the amount of extra energy going into the oceans is equivalent to two modestly sized atomic bombs per second. So, to, so that, you know, that is a lot of energy going in there. And of course, it's got to come out somewhere. And of course, when you, when you see that, it's, it's, uh, it's in the temperature of the ocean. That, of course, then drives all sorts of energy transfers into the atmosphere and so on. But of course, that second part of the problem here, as I said before, is that it's not only the greenhouse effect of CO2, but it's also the effect of CO2 entering the ocean and uh, changing the chemistry. And I think it's really important to know that we're already outside where we've been uh, in terms of ocean chemistry and temperature in the ocean, uh, where it's been for at least a, a million years. Now, of course, that goes well beyond the lifetime of our species. So we're entering into very uncharted territory. And I did this uh, calculation with a number of colleagues uh, in an article which we published in Science, where you can take the Vostok ice core. I don't know whether you know that a lot of the climate records come from um, uh, essentially an ice core drilled in Antarctica. And it's in a particular part of Antarctica where as the 
uh, snow is falling evenly over time, you get gas being trapped, you can use then isotopes to uh, derive all sorts of things such as average planetary temperature and ice volume and so on. But this record also has a record of CO2. And so you can take that plus temperature and with a couple of assumptions that are pretty safe, you can then calculate the carbonate ion concentration and the pH change from the CO2 and you can also get some idea about relative temperature. So if you do that for that record, and it's 420,000 years of record, you, and that's, again, that's longer than our species has been around, you find out that this is where we've been, interglacial warm periods, glacial periods, and essentially all of those values sit in this little blob of points. This is where we are today. So we're already migrating outside where we've been for that 420,000 year period. And if we now start to think about where the critical limits are, and I'll revisit this in a minute to, to, to assure you that these are fairly solid values, we find that there's this carbonate threshold where carbonate drops below 200 micromoles per kilogram water, and you no longer have the ability to to, to uh, precipitate calcium carbonate uh, if you're a coral at any rate that's going to keep up with uh, the rates of erosion on a reef. Right? So there's this one boundary there. We also know that when we get to about two degrees above the, uh, the, the, the pre-industrial uh, temperatures, so two degrees above today, we'll get to a point where uh, reefs will fall apart. And so we're on a trajectory now which is heading in this direction. Uh, we may get as far as sort of 900 parts per million by the end of this century. And of course, we'll be in a box here in which my favorite ecosystem uh, will no longer be up for study. Maybe some paleo guys can do some work. But uh, as for sort of extant reefs, it, it re looks really grim. And it's really hard to find a, a way of saying this or a way of getting around this particular conclusion. Well, I now want to introduce you to my office. And this is uh, Heron Island in Australia. And I can tell you it's a terrible place to work. Uh, right here is the laboratories of the University of Queensland. This is a eight square kilometre platform reef, uh, which is at the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. And it's still an incredibly beautiful place to work. Now, when we look at coral reefs, we have to remember, of course, that there are uh, a number of things that are affecting them. And so uh, throughout the world, there are probably three things that coral reefs are really suffering from. The first is overexploitation in those, those fish species that are important for maintaining reefs, those garden pest control officers and so on. The second major issue is that we're changing the way coastlines work. So we're chopping down the trees, putting in rice paddies, doing lots of stuff, and lots of mud and nutrients are flowing out onto reefs and, and, and killing them. And of course, as I've said, this uh, third component is, is climate change. Now, these two are already in devastating operation right now. This is starting to occur. Now, out of the two, out of the three, this to me is the most worrying because the changes we make will be in place for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Whereas I think these things, uh, we have a really good chance of fixing if we get the right policies in place. Now, the effect of climate on reefs is quite dramatic. And this is a picture of mass coral bleaching. Has everybody heard of mass coral bleaching? So essentially what happens here, and this is a picture that I took in 2006, uh, nearby Heron Island, uh, the waters were just a little warm at that time, a couple of degrees above the normal summer temperature. And literally overnight, corals went from beautiful brown colour, which I, you saw before, to a bone white. And it looks very beautiful, but what you're seeing here is the symbiosis that corals have with dinoflagellates known as zooxanthellae having fallen apart. Now, these guys are critical to reefs. They live inside the gastrodermal tissues, inside the cells, they photosynthesize, they passed 
they pass over 95% of what they're capturing from the sun in terms of sugars and amino acids. They're passing that to the animal host, the coral, and the coral uh, is supplying some nutrients back in terms of waste metabolism. But this arrangement is so, so um, efficient and, and productive that reefs can put down enormous amounts of calcium carbonate, and as a result, they're able to create a three-dimensional structure in which as many as a million species probably live. Now, the trouble with coral bleaching is that um, it's on the rise. This is a, uh, a map from 1998 uh, which has uh, red dots, so severe bleaching, um, uh, other colours at, at different levels of, of impact. And that's 1998. When you look at 2006, uh, the numbers of, of impacts that have, have occurred through uh, coral bleaching, it's, it's a lot higher. So there's a perception that this is increasing. The other thing that's sort of mysterious about this, this process or, or ecological phenomenon, if you like, is that there are no scientific reports of it prior to 1979. It seems to pop up. Now you can see by that photograph, right, that that's hard to miss. Because some people have said, well, you know, scientists are sort of, you know, they're like bandwagons. Someone discovers something, then everyone wants to be on the bandwagon. Well, this is a bandwagon that, that uh, I think someone should have jumped on a lot earlier if it was happening. And in fact, it appears that it was a rare, if not absent, phenomenon prior to 1979. It's a very interesting um, issue. Now, the important thing about this phenomenon is that it's not just about um, corals and losing corals from reefs. And this is a devastated reef that's had bleaching and crown of thorns and has lost its coral. But it's also about that three-dimensional structure. And so what you're seeing here, um, and I'll play that again, is a reef that's lost its corals and the entire structure is starting to break down. And as you see, there's not a lot of fish there as well. So the corals disappear, that three-dimensional structure and all the other bits of of, of, of what corals are, are supplying um, disappear as well. Okay, so um, there's a number of other issues here. Um, we know from about coral bleaching that it's increasing, hasn't been seen before 1979. It can lead to very high rates of mortality of almost complete um, coral loss from reefs, triggered by very small increases in sea temperature, and we know that is uh, it's a fairly locked down uh, fact because satellites can predict when and where coral bleaching is going to occur by just simply reporting how warm it is, what the anomaly is. And uh, we also know that it's exacerbated by ocean acidification. Now what about the future? Well, this is a study done in 1999 and what it does is just simply say, okay, well, if we know that sea temperatures above a certain amount on a coral reef will have a big impact, then what's going to happen in the future? And so teaming up with a bunch of climate uh, scientists, we were able to uh, predict essentially what uh, sea temperature would do with a doubling of CO2. And what you see here, going from 1860 to 2100, uh, 100, end of the century, is this slow rise in the temperature, and you've got the winter, summer, signal as well there. These lines are the known uh, points at which, or the known temperatures at which corals get into trouble. And as you see in places like Jamaica, in the Caribbean, there's even the suggestion that by the end of the century, winter will be too warm for corals. Again, this is pretty hard to argue against. And, and I, 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 you know, I know there's some other uh, suggestions that maybe we could have uh, very fast evolution, um, we could have migration and so on, but there are a whole series of issues associated with those suggestions which don't seem to work particularly well. Now I want to introduce an experiment we've been doing in Australia uh, where we have uh, literally recreated conditions or created conditions similar to those that we'll face at the end of the century. And we've also dialed back the clock to look at how well reefs were growing in the pre-industrial period. And at this point I need to introduce Sophie Dove who's my uh, colleague and uh, uh, fellow scientist. Um, we ha have a lab on Heron Island. This is the experiment that we've been running uh, for well over a year now. 
these are flow through tanks in which we manipulate the CO2 concentration and the temperature according to what scenarios we are investigating. They flow through, so water is sort of flowing into sumps over here, being mixed, put out here, and then flows back to the ocean. And what we've done in those ones is to then add, in some cases, uh, mild scenarios or fairly, you know, business as usual scenarios uh, to data that's coming from a CSIRO boy, uh, which is being run by Bronte Tilbrook, which is measuring real time. Uh, pH, temperature, and so on. Because one of the big questions is that if you do an experiment like this, you need to have that variability because it is getting cooler in the winter and warmer in the summer, and there are these sort of natural, uh, this natural variability between days and so on. So we take the previous year's data and we manipulate, we use it to manipulate uh, these conditions. So this is temperature, and this is the pHs. So this one here is actually where we dial back the clock to get back to the pre-industrial. And so that temperature, uh, that pH is 8.3, and the temperature is a couple of degrees cooler than these uh, greenhouse scenarios. Well, here's what happens month by month in today's treatment, where we've got 400 parts per million, and we've got uh, just the temperatures uh, surrounding it. And you see the reef ends up pretty good, right? Let's go back to 1850. Again, pretty much corals are surviving. We've got all sorts of, we've recreated a little reef called Harry's Balmy. We did environmental, uh, stu uh, ecological studies and recreated those communities so that we had everything. We've got the variability, we've got exactly the same sets of creatures, and then we've manipulated them. And of course we've replicated. So, same thing there. Well this is, this is best case scenario. This is if we really get cracking on solutions. Bleaching. Death of corals, and you can see by the end of that experiment, it's not looking particularly good. If we go even, if we, we, we don't do anything, and we continue to pump two parts per million into the atmosphere, this is what happens. And this, uh, I should say, is the scenario that we're on at the moment, which is by the end of the century, we'll, we'll have uh, oceans that were anywhere from three to six degrees warmer. We'll have up to 900 parts per million uh, in terms of CO2. And here's what's happened, what happens when you apply those conditions. You can see bleaching, death, and no bounce back. So with that, there are a bunch of other things we're doing in those experiments. One of those that's very important is looking at the rates of calcification. So here's the pre-industrial. And these are just time periods over which you measure calcification using the anomaly method. And you can see that as you go to the control and pre-industrial, there doesn't seem to be too many differences there. But as soon as you get to that mild future scenario or the more extreme one, you're starting to get to a point where reefs are starting to decalcify. And that, I, I guess, is what we've been seeing in some parts of the world. And it, of course, represents a major change in terms of how reefs work, and of course if this, this is the future, then we're talking about the food, the industries and so on as being in trouble. This is what we thought might happen in 2007, and essentially we've got that in those tanks. So you're moving from today to the mild, mild response scenario to one where you're starting to get reefs break down, breaking down. Well, of course, I don't have time to talk about the oceans in general. Um, one of my other roles is as the coordinating lead author of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change chapter on the oceans. But in reviewing that information, it's very clear that the things we're seeing in coral reefs are being mirrored in many other parts of the world. Different things are happening, but really fundamental change is, is occurring. We've got migrating species, we've got collapsing ecosystems, We've got reduced ocean ventilation, the tendency for the ocean to, to uh, uh, circulate uh, from deep to shallow. We've got inundated coastal ecosystems, expanding dead zones, uh, decreasing oxygen acidification. And we've got everything to say we need to now take steps to prevent this from getting any worse because, you know, ultimately, as I said, oceans are important to us. They are essentially allowing our species to uh, to thrive, and of course, killing oceans really 
uh, is a problem. So what I want to finish with is just this concept. It's really clear that our destiny is intertwined with the health of the ocean. If the oceans go down, we go down as well. We won't be able to feed as many people. Uh, the services that are being provided in terms of limiting the amount of climate change, uh, all those things that we are uh, dependent on uh, is this highly intertwined nature uh, between us. But I've given these talks for about 20 years and you know, there's a lot of people that do are concerned, but there's a lot of people who are not. So you have to ask the question, how do we get people to engage with the ocean? Now, as I said, only 0.1% of humanity has actually been diving. So if you haven't been to a coral reef or to a kelp forest in Southern California, you don't have a reason to, for, for really you know, I mean, worry. I mean, if you don't, if you don't know about, if you have never been to a coral reef, then your uh, motivation to take steps because everyone's connected. The problems are coming from um, from cities all over the world. You don't, you, you don't have any um, compelling urge to sort of uh, to, to to take the steps to prevent this from happening. You know, what's a coral reef to you? So, we've been working with Google on a project where we're taking street view and take it underwater. And this is uh, Heron Island where you can go. The response to this has been quite uh, amazing. So we we um, launched this in California um, um, at the Blue Ocean Festival, and uh, within a within a week or so, we had three uh, three million Google Plus friends. Now, I had to go and talk to my 16-year-old daughter to find out what that really meant, but um, <laughs> it means you're pretty popular. We also had um, media outreach that uh, they can measure where stories go and so on and who might read them uh, to 1.1 billion people. Now the point about this is that the science is compelling and has been compelling for a long time. The next step is to, uh, to communicate it so that everyone gets the message that the ocean is in trouble and we have a limited time in which to take steps to prevent it from being damaged forever. And so I think these types of ways of, of communicating to people so that we can have a Russian grandmother and an Ethiopian teen and an Australian uh, you know, businessman all go diving and understand that the ocean is something which is just too precious uh, to lose. So I think this conference comes at a really important time. We've got the IPCC about to present the fifth assessment report. We've got the Global Partnership for Oceans, which was uh, launched in Singapore last year and which will be open for business in September. And this is a $1.5 billion initiative of the World Bank, which is trying to find new ways, new partnerships between business and science and governments and so on to start to address these really, really compelling issues that, that oceans are facing. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for listening and hoping uh, that everyone here uh, will join us on what will be, I think, an exciting and successful decade of turning around the crisis we have in our oceans. Thank you. Thank you, that was amazing. Really appreciate it, fantastic. Um, our next speaker, I'm just trying to keep things rolling along so that we don't um, get behind schedule. Our next uh, speaker is Steve Hawkins. 
Steve is the Dean of the Faculty of Natural and Environmental Sciences at the University of Southampton. And I've actually